I've been talking to the Lord about you and he's been talking to me about his word and I believe he's given me a word that's going to fit the continuity of where you are and may open up some entrails and some thoughts and some mechanisms inside of you that rejuvenate you and cause you to know that where you are is not where you're going to stay and cause you to appreciate where you've been and where God is about to take you to. Great things in store for the people of God. Somebody put your hands together and give God some praise right now. That's right. That's right. He is the rock of ages. He is the God in the middle of a storm. He's our bridge over troubled waters. And we're not afraid to give him the praise. Don't you be afraid to give him the praise. Right there in your living room, right there at your dining room table, let God be God and every man a liar. Because if God be for you, he's more than the world against you. I want to invite your prayerful consideration to 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, verse 1 through 10. Again, 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, verse 1 through 10. Amen. It is our custom to stand for the reading of God's Word. And if you're not incapacitated, we invite you to do so as we consider what thus saith the Lord to his people. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good. For his mercy, oh my God, check that out. For his mercy uh, endureth forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 20 and 2,000, 20 and 2,000, check that out, 20 and 2,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. And the priests waited on their offices, the Levites also with instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord, because his mercy endureth forever when David praised by their ministry. And the priests sounded trumpets before them, and all Israel stood. Moreover, Solomon hollowed the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings and the meat offerings and the fat. Also, at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him, a very great congregation, from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt. And in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly, for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. And on the Three and twentieth day of the seventh month, he sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry in heart for the goodness that the Lord had showed unto David and to Solomon and to Israel, his people. Can you say amen? Can you say amen again? Remain standing. I'm going to pray with you. I want to talk to you from the subject, they don't see the ashes. They don't see the ashes. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, we approach thy throne in the invincible, almighty, everlasting, immutable, unchanging name of Jesus Christ. We come that you might touch, heal, and deliver, that you might fortify, that you might strengthen, that you might validate, that you might expand and increase even amongst us and in us and with us and through us, perpetuating your word in cycles from generation to generation, breaking down every yoke and every chain and every fetter, establishing yourself until your presence becomes my norm, until your glory becomes my reality, 
until your word becomes my thought. Oh, God, have preeminence in this moment. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Have your way in the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody who loves him, shout amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Several years ago, now decades, I had the privilege of going uh, to Africa for the very first time. It was mind-blowing and life-changing from a cultural perspective to go to the land of my heritage and roots and to have the opportunity to experience a culture that had got, got lost in the cyclone of history and debauchery and pain and agony. I reconnected with the other side of the family in a way that resonated with me in a very personal and powerful moment. That same year, I also got an opportunity to go to Israel, the motherland of my faith, to have an opportunity to walk up and down the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem, to have an opportunity to see where Jesus lay, to see what he went through and what it was like, the same streets and avenues and alleys to go into the Garden of Gethsemane, to stand on the Mount of Olives and overlook the city, to, to have an opportunity to go down to the Jordan River, to have an opportunity to stand by the Sea of Galilee. It was absolutely amazing. But one of the things that moved me most was something that I didn't even expect to move me in the way that it did. They brought me down to the Wailing Wall. And when I came down to the Wailing Wall, I had an encounter with God. Now, what is called the Wailing Wall today is really just the ruins of the temple. It's what remains of what Solomon built. And yet it has become such a powerful monument to the historicity of the Hebrew faith that even at this current moment, there are Jews going down to the Wailing Wall and Christians and yes, even Muslims going down to the Wailing Wall to pray. And they take their prayer requests and write them down and stick them in the cracks in the wall. And the Jews stand in front of the wailing wall and they rock back and forth, symbolic of the blood rocking through the body and the presence of God moving and never stopping. The idea is that if you stand before a moving God, you have to move like he moves. You have to flow like he flows. You have to be in concert with him. And I, I went down to the wailing wall, the women on one side, the men on the other, and when I got down to the wall and began to pray, I don't know what came over me, but tears started coming out of my eyes and rushing down my face. And, and it was such a spiritual encounter for me that I will never forget what it was just to be at what was left of Solomon's temple. Just, just to stand there as a testimony of the authenticity of what we believe and what we read and what we understand and stand there in the ruins of evidence of the plan and the mind of God, stand there in the evidence of the stones that had been erected, some still standing there as a testament that God was there. These were the stones that encountered the glory that we just read about. The power fell on them and the priest could not enter into the place. It was absolutely mind boggling. It made me wish that I had been there when the temple itself was erected. I don't want to go back in time, but I just wanted to visit that spot and just be mesmerized by the temple. Not only its structure, its grandiose structure, its columns of ivory, its brazen altars of mammoth proportions, its brazen altar where many lambs and sacrificial offerings were burnt. Not just that, not just the ceremonies of coming to the gate, not just the presence of and the power of God going into the holies of holies. But to go there and just to be there and to know that not only was it the, the, the magnificence and the, 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 the glory that existed on the building, but when the Queen of Sheba came there, she said it was not just the building, it was the order of the men. It was, it was how Solomon's temple was organized and orchestrated, how developed it was, how she saw God in the order of how they went up. She said, how excellent are your men. And she said, I stand here breathless at how they go up. Not, not how they go down. Notice how she said how they go up. She saw their ascension 
the ascension of worship, the ascension of praise, the ascension of glory. The Queen of Sheba, who was no rookie, no novice herself, she wasn't a peasant. She wasn't a farm girl who had walked miles and miles from Africa to come to Jerusalem to have this experience. No, she was a queen in her own rights. She didn't come to Solomon to get a loan. She had her own wealth and she had her own resources and her own affluence. This young black woman that history says had remained a virgin until she met Solomon, came to the temple to experience Solomon for the first time. And though it is not in your Bible, it is recorded in history that she and Solomon later birthed a child together called Menelik, who later ruled in Ethiopia. And to all of those voices out there that say there is no blackness in the Bible, you must not have read. You must not have read it because we are sprinkled throughout the Bible. We are standing there with the Queen of Sheba. We are standing there with all of her gold and her ivory and all of her silver and all of her riches. Now, I want you to understand that this was not just a physical attraction. The oddity about the Queen of Sheba connecting with Solomon was not just the physicalities of, of his stature and his prowess and her beauty and her curves and her African hair and her Nubian beauty. No, it was more than that. Their courtship was... Uh, a, a, a moment of intellectual stimulation. She, she grilled him and quizzed him and tested him to see if he was brilliant enough. She knew he was wealthy enough, but was he smart enough that she would give up her virginity to produce a child that had the right traits and ability? She, let, she selected him like they were on a dating game, like they were on a courtship, like they were trying, like she was interviewing somebody. She interviewed him, and at the more they talked and the more they interacted, the more she was mesmerized by his wisdom. Little did she know that his wisdom was not his own, that his wisdom was the gift that God had given him. That God had graced Solomon with such wisdom that the Bible says there has never been a man before or since whose wisdom paralleled with that of Solomon. And it was exemplified in what he built. If you want to know who somebody is, watch what they build. Watch what they do. Watch what they say. What's the evidence, the fruit of intellectualism is all engulfed in Solomon's mind. Solomon's mind left the queen without breath. Solomon's mind left her awed in his presence. Solomon's mind so overwhelmed her that she almost decided to stay. But she turned around and went back to her people and came back bringing her God and her faith and her son back to Ethiopia and started to worship Jehovah in Ethiopia. That, that, that was the experience. And it is said by many scholars that when the Song of Solomon talks about she was black and comely, that he's talking about her. That when he's talking about how beautiful her breast and body was and her thighs was, that he is talking about her. Whatever happened, I don't know, I wasn't there, but whatever happened, it was absolutely amazing. She had been mesmerized by his mind. Solomon's mind is exemplified in the building of the temple. You must understand that he is fulfilling where his father fell. For it was David's desire to build the temple. It was David's desire. He had reserved the cedars of Lebanon, Lebanon for no other reason but to build up the temple. But God would not allow David to build the temple, saying that there had been too much bloodshed. David could dream it, but he couldn't touch it. He could design it, but he couldn't reach it. He had the prowess to build it. He had the power to build it. He had the resources to build it, but he did not have the permission to build it. God had given Solomon permission. I want to talk to some people that God has given you some permission to do some things that other people couldn't do. And you're wondering why they don't understand you and why they don't like you and why you don't fit in. It's because God said yes to you when he said no to them. And you got to walk in your yeses, whether they like it or not. You got to stand in the integrity of what God did for you, what he spoke to you, what he said to you, what he placed inside of you. And you don't need everybody to see it for you to be able to do it. Because when God gives you permission to do a thing, you can do things that other people cannot do. You can go places that other people can't go. You can reach people that other people cannot reach. You can have an effect where other people are ineffective. And just because they fail does not mean that you cannot win. 
I want to talk to some exceptional people this morning who exceed against the odds, who exceed against the rules, who went in where others went out, who finished school where others did not, who accomplished heights and depths and widths beyond your imagination. I know the devil's been telling you how many times you failed, but let me tell you something. Instead of counting up how many times you failed, count up how many times you won. Count up the times that God stood with you. Count up the times that God gave you beauty for ashes. Count up the times that God gave you opportunities that you didn't even deserve. Count up the times that God brought you into places that were mind-blowing and you don't even know how you got there, but God just graced you with an ability that passed all knowledge. God just handed it down to you. Somebody right now, you're grappling with something in your own self. You don't know what to do with it, but God's going to give you wisdom. Wisdom to raise a child. Wisdom to build a marriage. Wisdom to establish a business. Wisdom to write a book. Wisdom to go forward. It's God that gives you the wisdom. Solomon had the wisdom of God. But the wisdom of God without the trees of his father would have never built the temple. You must see that he got the wisdom from his God, but he got the resources from his father. That's why we can't be satisfied to see our men go down because there's something that a son gets from his father that gives him trees for his building. I may not build what you build, but I got your trees. Solomon had David's trees, the trees that he had gathered from Lebanon. The trees that were so valuable that David had used them in his house and he was ready to build God's house, but he was not allowed to build God's house. He built a tabernacle, David's tabernacle, a, a small tent, but he was not allowed to build God's house. God wasn't too worried about houses, no way. For God said, I'm not a man that I dwell in houses made of stone or bit of God dwells in the whole universe. Heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. God is too big to be contained by building in the first place. But David, you can't build it because you messed up too many times. But what I will let a broken father do is pass whole wood to his son. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. I will allow a broken, failed father to pass whole wood to his son. And Solomon walks into this opportunity armed with the wood of his father. More than he could carry. More than a few men could haul. It was his father's wood that built the young man's dream. His trees had been inherited. His blessings have been passed down. Some of the things that God is allowing you to gather, you will not finish. Some of the things you start, you will not end. Some of the things that you begin, you will not complete, but you will begin it and the next generation will complete it because you started something. And if you start something, it's going to pass to the next generation. may not look like it right now. They may be wild right now. Solomon was wild a long time and a lot of the time. But ultimately, what God puts in you will eventually come out. In my text, it talks about the completion of Solomon's temple. It was utterly amazing to complete the temple. The temple symbolized the presence of God. The glory was so amazing. It was so opulent. It in no way compared to any temple they had ever had before. They had never seen anything like Solomon's temple. It was palatial. It was mighty. It was great. I want you to build something bigger than you. I want you to build something bigger than yourself, bigger than your resources, bigger than your finances, bigger than your neighbors, bigger than your thoughts, bigger than your idea. Now unto him that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we may ask or think when God gives you something, don't be scared because it's big. Don't be scared to be the first. Don't be scared to go against the grain because the Bible is full of men who were the first to build what they built. Nobody had built an ark until Noah did it. 
Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Nobody had built a tabernacle until Moses built it. Nobody had melted down gold and made an altar until the artisans did it. And nobody had built a temple like Solomon until Solomon did. God will put you in a class all by yourself. The problem with you is you've been praying to fit in. You ought to be praying to stand out. You've been praying to be accepted. You ought to be praying to be rejected because the stone that the builders reject. Whenever you're rejected, let me talk to some rejected people. Whenever you're rejected, it's a sign you've been selected. Whenever they shut doors on you, it's a sign God is getting ready to open up a door for you. Whenever men turn up their nose and revile you, it's a sign that you're accepted in the beloved. When they cast you out, God will take you in. David said, when my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. There's something about standing out, not fitting in. Not being one with the pack, not being one with the herd, not hanging out with the fellas, not being one of the boys. You ought to be willing to stand out sometime. The problem today is everybody wants to fit in. See me, like me, follow me, befriend me, me, me. No, stand out. God is putting you in a situation where you're going to stand out. He shut down the country. He shut down the world so that you could get used to standing out, being by yourself, being in isolation, thinking your own thoughts, not needing everybody's validation to know who you are, know what you got. Get your vision together. Get your plan straight. God's giving you some time off for you to get your strategy together because out of the mind of Solomon comes the temple of Solomon. You can't build it if you can't think it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you can get it in your head, you can get it in your life. Somebody asked me, what is success? I said, success is not a dollar amount. It's not a house on top of the hill. It's not a Rolls Royce or a Bentley car. Success is when you can get your vision out of your head and in front of your face. When you can see the thing materialize. And brick by brick, block by block, masonry by masonry, the walls of Solomon's temple kept going up higher and higher and higher. And all the people were amazed because Solomon was their king. We need great leaders. Great people need great leaders. There's nothing worse than being a great man stuck behind a small one. <laughs> than being a good man stuck behind a bad one. Than being an anointed person following somebody that don't have no power. You got to have a leader that's worthy of your allegiance that thinks big enough, that thinks strong enough, that thinks high enough, that has the depth of glory and weight and anointing that when he comes in the room, it's not hard to respect success. Solomon built the temple and the walls went up and the steeples were built and it was constructed and it was absolutely amazing. But in my text, it is not the opulence of the building. It is not the architectural design of the temple. It is not the gold materials that are used in the building. It is not the granite floors nor the marble columns that causes them to be in awe. No, all of that was wonderful until God's glory sat down on the building. And when God's glory hit man's work, all of a sudden, all they could see was the glory of God. <sighs> When God sat down on their efforts, that's what I want God to do. I want him to anoint what I'm working on. I want him to anoint what I'm doing. I want him to sit down on what I'm trying to build. I don't want to build it if he's not going to sit down on it. When God's glory fell down on the temple, all religious orders stopped. The priests stopped doing what they were doing. All the Levites were standing there in awe. They were ready to play the instruments that David had created. David was so creative, not only did he play instruments, he made instruments. And the instruments had now outlived him. And now we're seeing the second generation of Levites that are continuing the legacy of the music of David who has gone on, and yet his songs are still filling the air. When the glory 
head of the Lord fell. It fell on them because they were praising God and they were worshiping God. It didn't fall on them because they had gold. It didn't fall on them because they had columns. It didn't fall on them because they had granite. It fell because they had praise. And when the praises went up, the glory came down. And the glory came down so strong that the priests had to be still and the Levites had to stop because God had taken over the room. His glory had filled up the temple. It had filled every room, every cul-de-sac, every avenue, every closet, every corner was filled with His glory. I pray that right now the glory of God would get in your house. I pray it would get in your living room. I pray it would get in your dining room. I pray it would stand up in your kitchen. I pray it would overflow into your bedroom and get in all of your closet. I pray that the glory would sit on your house so strong that COVID couldn't get near your house because the house was filled. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. The house was filled with glory. Throw your hands up and say, fill it with glory. God's going to fill it with glory. He's going to fill your business with glory. He's going to fill your family with glory. He's going to fill your pockets with glory. Throw your hands up and say, fill it with glory. The glory of the Lord sat down on the house and it filled all the house. God always feels whatever he forms. He formed the earth and filled it with vegetation. He formed the sea and filled it with fish. He formed the air and filled it with birds. He formed the tabernacle and filled it with furniture. He formed the holies of holies and filled it with glory. He formed man and filled him with breath. Whenever you see God form a thing, he will always feel whatever he forms. What we are looking at in this text is that, that, that opiate, that moment, that crystallized, stellar, significant, unforgettable moment when the divine touches the human, when the celestial touches the terrestrial, when that which is above us comes and sits down amongst us, when grace and truth are met together when mercy and peace have come together, when the holy and the human collide in an exodus of praise so powerful that it crescendos all through the chapter. It was so strong that Solomon got scared he might lose it. I want to talk to some blessed people that are blessed but scared you're going to lose it. He came to God and he said, this is so amazing. What happens if I lose it? What happens if you shut up the heavens and there are no more rain? What happens if it doesn't work anymore? I want to talk to some people that are anxious because the enemy's been telling you you're going to lose everything you got, but the devil is a lie. Solomon said, what happens if you shut up the heavens and there is no more rain and the crops stop and the glory doesn't flow? What happens if it all breaks down? And God gave him a key, said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. Seek my face, turn from that wicked way. Then, 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 slap the neighbor and say, then, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Heal our land, God. Heal our land. Heal our land, oh God. Heal our land. When the glory came in, the priests lay prostrate. The worshipers collapsed. The people all over Israel were standing in amazement, gazing up at the presence of God, almost in a daze, experiencing the power of God coming from the presence of God. But what they did not see, they saw the glory. They saw the labor. They saw the altar. They saw the building. They saw the pillars. They saw the foundations. They even saw the wailing wall that I stood in front of, rocking back and forth. They saw all that. But they did not know that Solomon's temple 
was built right where Ornan's threshing floor was. Ornan's threshing floor is what happened in the previous generation. You remember when David had counted the people and God judged him in his sins and God let a plague come upon his people and there was disaster and pestilence and disease everywhere. And David was trying to break the curse that was on the land. And he came to the threshing floor of Ornan. And the threshing floor, you see, is the place where wheat is separated from chaff. It was the threshing floor. It was the place of separation. And Ornan owned the place. And David said, I need this place. I need this place so that I can offer up a sacrifice toward God. And he wants to know, what will it cost? And, and Ornan offers him, you know, whatever you want to give me, whatever you want to do, however you want to do. He said, oh, David said, no, 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 no. I will pay the full price. The full price. See, that's the difference between greatness and weakness. Everybody wants it. But not many people want to pay full price. Everybody wants to be acknowledged, but they don't want to pay full price. Everybody wants an opportunity, but they don't want to pay full price. Everybody wants to do something about it, but they can't pay the full price for it. They don't get it. They don't understand it. They don't realize it. They don't, they don't know. They don't understand. They don't, they don't recognize. How much does it cost? And David paid the full price. Are you willing to pay the full price of faith? Or are you just going to talk the talk, play the game, go through the religious colloquialisms, but when your faith comes down to the wire, are you willing to pay full price to walk into this next realm? to walk into this next realm, to walk into this next opportunity, to walk into this next move of God, to walk into the presence of God, to walk into what God has for you, to walk into the promotion that God is getting ready. Are you willing? Or do you want goodwill? You want charity? You want hand-me-downs? You want God to give you something for nothing? David said, no, I will not offer to God something that costs me nothing. I won't offer him that which is easy. I won't tip him like he's a busboy. I won't leave him changed like he's a waiter. I won't leave him a couple of dollars like he's a maid. I will pay the full price. My God, it makes you wonder. It makes you wonder if David recognized when he was paying the full price, did he recognize that his son would build on what he bought? <laughs> Did he recognize that he was paying a multi-generational price that would change the trajectory for generations to come? It makes you wonder how God could bring the blessing out of a mess, how God could bring a blessing out of a curse, how God could bring a blessing out of a plague, how God could move in the middle of COVID-19. See, some people, all they see it's the problem, but they don't see the opportunity. The, all David was trying to do was stop the sword of the angel. And the Bible said that he bought the threshing floor of Ornan, and he burned up the threshing floor of Ornan, and he offered up sacrifice unto God. And it occurred to me when I was reading about Solomon's temple, and they were talking about how elaborately it was made and how flamboyantly it was decorated. And they were talking about the opulence and the decor. And they were talking about the worship and the protocol and the service and the excellence and the excellence of their men. I wondered, did they not see that it was all built on ashes? And when I thought about that, I thought about life itself. The people are always talking about your glory. <laughs> but they don't know nothing about your story. They're always weighing out what you got, but they don't know what it costs you. They're always talking about what you accomplished, but they don't, they don't know what you went through. And, and it made me want to preach this message. They don't see the ashes. They don't see the ashes. 
They run their mouths, but they don't see the ashes. They turn up their nose, but they don't see the ashes. They're jealous and envious, but they don't see the ashes. You don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. Everything that Solomon built was built on the ashes that David burned. Out of the ashes and the despair of his father's failures came his son's glory. I want to talk to every son who had a failed father. Out of the ashes of a failed father came the glory of the next generation. Stop despising your father's ashes because everything you're going to build is going to be built on the ashes your father left behind you. Solomon only owned the land because David paid full price for it. And David was wrestling with his own sins. And yet his sins and the place he wrestled became the place where Solomon erected the first temple. How much of your success is built on your ashes? Somebody asked me if I could go back in time and do it all over again. What would I change? And at first I started thinking of all the things I would change, and then I said nothing. I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change my mistakes. I wouldn't change my failures. I wouldn't change my weaknesses. I wouldn't change my problems. I wouldn't change my mishaps. I wouldn't change my haters. I wouldn't change my enemies. Why? Because if it had not been for all of that, there wouldn't be this standing here right now. People don't see the ashes. Oh, y'all don't hear me. I feel like praising him right now. I've been through too much. I cried too many nights. I suffered too long. I questioned myself too many times. I almost gave up. But people don't see. They don't see the ashes. They don't see the ashes. All of that glory that was so strong that Solomon had killed thousands of sheep just to honor God on this face. And people did not recognize that the magnitude of his sacrifice, his giving, his flowing, his sowing, provoked the presence of God. And God's glory sat down on the sacrifices of Solomon. You could see Solomon's sacrifice. You could see, you could hear the blaring of the sheep. You could hear the sound of the oxen. And it makes sense that God would sit down on Solomon's sacrifice. The reason you can't get God to sit down, you don't have no sacrifice. If you give God a sacrifice, he'll sit down on that sacrifice. And I looked at it and I said, oh God, I see you sitting on Solomon's sacrifice. And God said, yeah, not only am I sitting on Solomon's sacrifice, I'm also sitting on David's ashes. I wanted David to know that your mistakes were not in vain. Your failure was in the plan. I knew you would mess up. I knew I would have to chasten you because you're my son. I knew it would drive you to the threshing floor of Ornan. I knew you had too much integrity to let him give you something for nothing. I knew you would pay full price. And because you paid full price, that same spot that you paid for, I will allow your son to reap a blessing. You have been talking about generational curses. I want to talk to you about generational blessings. I want to tell you how God will cause blessings to overtake you, run up behind you and tackle you. They'll run you down and they'll come upon you and you die. You don't even know where they came from. You look around and you won't even recognize yourself because the blessing was chasing you. Even when you were falling and stumbling and failing and messing up, the blessing was chasing you. I will not die in my failures because I got too much chasing me. Holler at me, holler at me, holler at me. If you got something chasing me, holler at me, holler at me, holler at me. If you got something coming up on you, the blessing of the Lord overtook him. And all of Solomon's people saw the glory. And the queen of Sheba saw the order. 
And all of Solomon's people saw the sheep and the bleeding of the lambs, but they did not see the ashes. Solomon didn't get there by himself. It was not just his father's strengths, but it was also his weaknesses. Solomon wouldn't have been born if it were not for his father's weaknesses. Solomon's mama was his daddy's weakness. <laughs> Solomon's mama was Bathsheba. Solomon's mama was somebody else's wife. If it had not been for his father's wrongs, Solomon would not have had right. Stop crying about what went wrong because God will take wrong and make it right. God will take pain and make it power. God will take problems and build solutions. And out of the ashes of his father. Look up under your feet. Somewhere up under your feet are the ashes of your parents. their mistakes as well as their miracles created an opportunity for you to hunger like you hunger. <laughs> if, you, if you'd have got everything you needed when you needed it, you wouldn't have had enough hunger to be who you are right now. Uh, I'm not saying that they always did it to bless you, but even if they meant it for evil, God made it good. As we come to the close of this message, we close it with no regrets. <laughs> Not one regret. I apologize for every mistake, but I don't regret any of them because my miracles are made out of my mistakes and my successes are made out of my failures. And my victories are made out of my battles. And it was good for me that I was afflicted. So you go ahead and talk about my columns. Talk about the goal and the labor and the order and the orthodoxy through which I structured everything I did. But my feet are flat on the ground. And I know everything I got was built on ashes. If you have no ashes, you got no praise. But I want to appeal to the people watching me right now who are standing on ashes, who are standing on sorrows, who are standing on secrets, who are standing on pain, who are standing on trauma, who are standing on broken homes and broken dreams and broken promises and a tough childhood, this message is for you. <laughs> they see your job, but they don't see your ashes. <laughs> they see your car, but they don't see your ashes. They see that anointing on your life, but they don't, they don't see your ashes. God has a habit are constructing massive monuments on top of dirty ashes. He covered them. <laughs> uh -huh. Don't praise him unless you've been covered. He, he, he covered. Anybody been covered? Has he ever covered you? Has he ever covered you? He could have left you in the ashes, but God built on that thing. <laughs> God built on that thing. Ah! He stood on that thing. He established on that thing. He brought you up and he brought you out. And just in case anybody might see them, he sent his glory to sit on top of it so that when they looked over your way, ah, they saw them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Because they don't see the ashes. The ashes are between me and you. The ashes are why I raise my hand. The ashes are why tears come down my face. The ashes are why I clap my hands. The ashes are why I worship you. The ashes are why I'll let nothing that you give me become an idol to me because I know everything you gave me was built on the ashes. Thank you. <laughs> I can't let Sunday go without saying thank you. Thank you for every night I cried. Thank you for every tear I shed. Thank you for every burning eye. Thank you for every night I went to sleep holding a pillow in my arms. Thank you. Thank you for the rejection and the misunderstanding. And thank you for the pain. <laughs> and thank you for the storms and the trauma and the adversity and the agony. <laughs> thank you for the moaning. <laughs> thank you for the groaning. <laughs> thank you for the times, Lord, that I could not say a bubbling word. Oh, oh Lord. Oh, Lord. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Don't nobody know but me and you that my whole life, <laughs> everything I own, everything I drive, everything I wear, every place I live, that it's all built on ashes. And so I, I just, I worship you. For the next 60 seconds, I want everything that's got breath in your body and ashes under your feet to just worship God. Any kind of way you feel it, any kind of way you experience it, any kind of way you want to express it, just, 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 just. Come on, you got 45 seconds to just, to just, 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 Thank you, Lord. Oh! Thank you, Lord. Don't worry about them people. Don't you let them people bother you. You know what? <laughs> They're going to say whatever they want to say. They're going to talk as much as they want to talk. It don't even matter what they say about me. You know why? They don't see the ashes. They, they don't see the ashes. They don't see him. As I close this message, I call to the altar. Oh, I know you can't get to the building, but make an altar right there in your living room. Every mother, every daughter, every father, every son, the odds were against you. You should have been a case study. You should have lost your mind. You should have blown your brains out. But somehow God sustained you. He's got something he wants to build on those ashes. Stop medicating your pain. Stop trying to drink it out and smoke it out and do all kinds of other stuff to get it out. God wants them ashes. Out of them ashes. God's going to build himself a habitation through the Spirit. Come on to him. Get down on your knees and call on him right now. God said, I'll give you beauty for ashes. <laughs> I'll trade with you. You give me your ashes, I'll give you my beauty. <laughs> I'll give you beauty for ashes. I'll give you the all of joy for mourning. And I'll wrap you up in the garment of praise 
for that spirit of depression you got. God says, I want to trade with you this morning. Every backslider, every sinner, God says, I want to trade with you this morning. I come that you might have life. You can either go through the rest of your life and just sit down in the ashes of despair and blame all of your forefathers for what you are not, or you can take them ashes and build something amazing. Everything amazing you ever saw anybody build is always built on ashes. When you gonna get started? When you gonna start? When you gonna start? You gonna start now? You gonna start now? You gonna start? You gonna start? Open your heart, lift your hands, and ask him to come into your life. To come into your life right now. To come into your pain and your agony and your bitterness and your excuses and your frustration and your neglect and your abuse and your trauma. Ask God, what can you do with my ashes? Father, right now, you can see them in every house, in every living room, sitting parked in a car, looking at a phone. You can see them right now in the apartment complex, and that person staying above a garage, you can see them right now. That person that's watching in a hospital room, you can see them right now in the name of Jesus. That person, that person, that person, that young person who's watching me, don't even normally watch preachers, but they're watching me right now. God, let them see that those ashes are useful that what burned up didn't burn out, that you're gonna do something amazing in their life. Let them see this as a, a, a construction site, a new beginning. Right now, I want you to ask Jesus to come into your heart and to come into your life and to build something amazing where you were left sitting in the ashes. He's doing it. He's doing it right now. He's calling you to a higher place of praise. People are going to come from near and far to see what God built on the ashes of your life. If you can receive that, then this word is prophetic to you and it shall come to pass. Thus it is written, thus it is said, it shall come to pass. When you get it, don't you get high-minded. Don't you get caught up in all of that stuff. Don't you let people swell your head till you start looking down your nose. Always remember that your fans see your glory. They don't see your ashes. They don't see your ashes. Everything amazing that ever happened to you was built on ashes. It was built. It was built. It was built on the ashes. And they don't see the ashes. God bless you.